This man is described by some as one of the most important figures in countercultural art. But the chances are, you've never heard of him. Most of his work no longer exists and was painted illegally in the first place. King Rabo is a wanted man and protects his identity for fear of arrest. He's a myth, he's a legend. It's like the outlaw Jesse James, like, does he live, is he dead, where is he? He's one of the pioneers of graffiti writing, a movement that champions freedom of expression and can be seen on street corners all over the world. I do class myself as an artist, but also I can be a vandal at times, <laughs> you know, when I let that little monster out of the cage. This is Banksy, the enigmatic street artist who also came from graffiti and has sold a popular and commercially successful version back to the world. Countercultures against hedge fund managers and bankers. And they're the ones who don't buy Warhols and Picasso's anymore, they buy Banksy's. While Rabo's graffiti writing is reviled and criminalized, Banksy street art is faded by celebrities and endorsed by the authorities. There's someone saying, clean it off, and if it's a Banksy, leave it. The differing treatment of Rabo and Banksy is symptomatic of a wider battle between street art and graffiti. And until recently, both men were a universe apart. That was until one of them committed an act deemed so hostile, it shocked the graffiti world. It's caused fights, blood is drawn for the disrespect that it caused. And started the most divisive art feud since Matisse and Picasso. It is a graffiti war. We started it and, you know, I'll carry on until I'm finished. King Rabo is an international graffiti legend who's kept his identity secret from the authorities for over 25 years. Founding father of the British graph scene, he achieved infamy and respect in equal measure during the 80s, when his tag appeared all over London's trains and underground system. This is the tag, the R, the O, the B, the B, and the eye. And there's my little devil tail that comes through it. This is your basic tag. Well, it's not a basic tag. It's the, that's the best tag you'll ever see. <laughs> After a tag, you'll get the one letter throw up. There we go. And it's all just one movement. It's to be done quickly. And it's a baby R. It's my baby. This was like my trademark in the 80s. It was on every train going. When graffiti first came across the Atlantic, it was seen as another unwanted social ill imported from America. For the teenage Robbo, from a tough London council estate, bombing the trains was the way to raise a big middle finger to authority, as well as an opportunity to get his art seen by as many people as possible. An art gallery on wheels. And for a graffiti writer, that's the ultimate goal, is to do the trains. If you've got a piece running across London, you've got hundreds of thousands of people who are gonna see it. I mean, a piece of artwork running live, for everyone to see. I mean, that's no more exciting than that, you know? You'd catch the last train to whatever yard you was going to. You'd check it all out, make sure there was no police creeping around or anything. Under the cover of darkness, with usually very little light, you'd go to work doing your pieces. And you might do 20 or 30 trains. That's just bombing, 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 bombing. And I was doing that for years. You live graffiti 24-7 where you could get caught at any moment. You're living on the edge. It was about the adrenaline rush out of it. 
selling drugs and drink, and that was my drugs and my drink. I was going out doing graffiti. Robbo's talent and ingenuity made him the undisputed graffiti king in London in the 80s and early 90s. The reason Robbo has got so much respect is because he worked out how to get in pretty much every train yard in London, you know, before anyone else was going to any of the yards. He was the one who worked out, you know, how to get in, how to get out, how to do it properly. He was the one who smashed it all city. You can't really have any more respect for anyone, and anyone who's got the most remote idea about how graffiti works would automatically know that. But at the height of his fame, Robbo retired from graffiti. You know, I painted all the trains in London. I, I, I got up all over London. I was all city. I'd been all over Europe painting trains, and I'd been to America and painted trains in New York. You know, I couldn't really take it much further. It was sort of time to sort of go out and be responsible. I couldn't afford to get arrested and go to prison, because who's going to who's gonna support my children when I'm in prison? I'm no good to them there, so that's when I'll give up. All his work gradually vanished from the walls and trains of London, except for this piece. Painted in 1985 underneath the British Transport Police headquarters on a barely accessible spot of Regent's Canal, it became the oldest piece of graffiti in London and a testament to Robbo's legendary status. Even in retirement, Robbo was revered by new writers coming onto the scene. But then one night, he met a young artist from Bristol called Banksy. So I was in a place called the Dragon Bar down Old Street. I was introduced to a couple of guys and they was like, well, it's such an honor to meet you and stuff. You know, they was paying respect. When I was introduced to Banksy, I went, oh yeah, I've heard of you, mate, how you doing? And he went, well, I've not heard of you. Whenever I met someone, whether I heard of them or not, I always said I did hear of them. I never put no one down. And he dismissed me as a nobody and nothing. So with that, I slapped him. I went, what, you ain't heard of me? But you won't forget me now, will you? And with that, he picked up his glasses and he ran off. Ben Ein is a graffiti writer turned street artist who has worked with both Robbo and Banksy. He's aware their differences are more than just personal. I knew of Robbo a long time before I met him. He was definitely one of the graffiti writers that I would kind of look up to. I've been out painting with, uh, with Banksy a few times. Different doing street art than doing graffiti. Going out with Robbo, it'd be like a can of paint and just trying to do tags in places when people aren't looking. And then going out and painting stuff with Banksy was kind of... We'd work out where it was we were going to paint it, when we could get away with it. A lot more thought went into it, a lot more preparation. Banksy didn't seem to make much of an impact as a graffiti writer, so he tried something different, stencils. Sometimes of rats and human figures, sometimes of images borrowed from popular culture. I think what Banksy does is clever. You know, it appeals to people, it's funny, it's kind of vaguely political, you know, and he presents it in a way that is acceptable. With any kind of subculture, people want to buy into that. And he's done it, he's done it very well. King Ads, the author of many books on graffiti and street art, has no doubts about the importance of Banksy's use of stencils. Stencils have had an unbelievable effect on street art. If it wasn't for stencils, I wouldn't be here talking to 
a national broadcaster about what was essentially defined as vandalism. Banksy turned to stencils because it was quick, because it stopped him getting caught, and to quote him, it made a picture of a bunny look hard. The stencils took the street art from the street and put a price tag on it, made people want to invest in it. But while Banksy's work gained mainstream popularity, respect from the graffiti world was not forthcoming. Stencils is cheating. <laughs> Why did he say it was cheating to do a stencil? It's just that old graffiti thing that real graffiti writers paint trains and real graffiti writers nick their paint and real graffiti writers do everything freehand. And using stencils is cheating. You know, street artists make work to sell work, to make money, to have shows in galleries. And all of that goes against what graffiti is all about. You know, graffiti is kind of about male ego and damage. And graffiti's got a lot of self-imposed rules. However, Banksy doesn't play by graffiti's rules, and never did. In this book, published in 2009, Rabo told the story of the Dragon Bar fight for the first time, some 10 years after it happened. Shortly after the book came out, Banksy attacked Rabo's final surviving piece of work and turned the famous canal side piece into this. I was angry that it crossed the line by wiping out a bit of history. It took an iconic piece and used it to his own gains. That's a no-no. Banksy declined to be interviewed, but when asked to respond to Rabo's account, he said this. Banksy also supplied this photograph and says the canal piece was in such a bad state, he didn't realize he was painting over a piece of London history. Graffiti writing has a strict code of conduct. One of the most important rules is that you never incorporate a piece by another artist into your own work without their permission. Banksy did to Rabo. Well, for a piece to exist for 25 years in central London is like an Aztec temple or a, a Mayan ruin. Robbo's old piece was, it was there for years. It was like an institution. That was just downright wrong. That is a calculated diss. The thing about the feet is that it's territorial. It's like a dog pissing on a lamp post, you know, it is. Well, those pieces have been up since the 80s. And Banksy came along and toyed with it. In the graffiti world, Banksy doesn't have the right to come and do that. With us graffiti writers, there is a code of conduct. And if you was going to go over someone, you'd totally get rid of that piece and produce something new there. You want to incorporate their piece into your. If you do that, you're asking for trouble. Rabo was so incensed by Banksy's disregard for the rules of graffiti, he decided to fight fire with fire. This is where the artistic side of that argument developed. Within a week, I come back, I jumped on a lilo. It was Christmas Day morning, about 5 o'clock. I was drenched and freezing cold, and I converted his wallpaper uh, paster into him putting up King Robbo. Then he put the F-U-C in front of the king, so it was... Whoa. So I thought I'd come down here and get rid of the, the FUC, but now he's just had enough and he's, uh, he's painted over it. Banksy denies painting over it, but the graffiti war continued along the canal. Banksy put quite a good one, actually. Eh? It was, uh, I don't believe in global warming. Blanked out the global, and I turned it into war, so it said, I don't believe in war. And next year I went, it's too late for that, Sonny. He painted over it all and then put a bird with a 
roll ahead. And then I come back and I put, he's not the Messiah, he's a very naughty boy. Robo Team Robo. Team Robo, he stands for anyone that believes Banksy done the wrong move by using someone else's artwork. And once you agree with that, you're Team Robo. It's a loosely knitted thing, it ain't the crew where you got to be invited into it. This one here had a, a like a very thin fishing and he pulled out a Banksy tag. I got rid of the Banksy tag and I put, it, I put a placard up there saying street cred. He's not got no street cred with real writers because they just think he's a sellout who lives off graffiti. When I put street cred, he put a no fish inside. It's just pretty lame, really. What started off as tit for tat one upmanship between Robbo and Banksy degenerated into a wider battle of vitriol and personal insults between Team Robbo and Banksy's fans. Then Robbo called into question Banksy's artistic integrity. He, he nicked the rat from Black the Rat from France. He was the original rat stenciler. So I bought Banksy the Rat, so everyone gets the connection with Black and Banksy. And this is a stencil. <laughs> and this is my original rat that I used to spray in the streets of Paris in uh, 1981. As an art student in the 70s, Leck visited New York. The graffiti he saw there inspired him, just as it would Robbo, to produce his own graffiti. But Bleck wanted to create a new style. Instead of freehand letter writing, he used stencils. First of rats, then of human figures, often with a socio-political message. One of the pivotal moments of street art was when Bleck was inspired to start stenciling full-size figures in the street. That's when street art began to find its voice. It wasn't a tag, it was saying something. It must have been insane walking through Paris in the 80s and you turn a corner and there across the street would be a figure. It was almost ghost-like. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know that in 20, 25 years he was going to be hailed as the godfather of street art. He was just doing it. Nor did Bleck realize that his own very individual style would be so closely replicated on the streets of Britain. Robbo is en route to the canal. He is willing to risk his life and liberty to strike back at Banksy. Got to jump around a, a spiked fence, and then cross the train tracks. You got to be concerned with the electric rails because that'll liven you up. A lot of thought and a lot of planning goes into it just to cut down your odds of getting arrested. You got to know where all the CCTV is. You turn off your phones, pull your batteries out your phones, so you can't be tied to any masks. Our little thing goes to plan and get away with it without ending up in a police cell. Job done. Lovely. Do you get caught, do you run? Oh, yeah, I will bolt. Don't worry about that. I don't want to get arrested. I cut down and do the odds as much as I can in my favour. And the rest is in the hands of the gods.
<laughs> oh, I love the excitement. I just gotta let that little animal out the cage now and again for them juices to flow, do you know what I mean? A short walk down the towpath from the scene of Rabo's battle with Banksy, the graffiti war is raging on another front. Within Islington, we're trying to make our borough as clean, green, and as attractive as we possibly can. Our policy on graffiti is that we don't allow graffiti. Graffiti is, as a, is criminal damage. So people who are spraying graffiti onto walls or tagging are, are committing a criminal act. Yes, we have arrested people. We've been successful in taking a few people to court. And um, two or three people have actually been sent to prison for the mindless vandalism that they've caused. Above the graffiti writing that Martin and Darren are removing, the piece of street art is being left alone. Some people might say they're more or less the same. Why are you taking yeah. one off and not the other one? Yeah, the, the, that is the argument with with art or what you call art or graffiti. I mean, to me, personally, you should, you should remove everything, really. It's hard to, to decipher what is uh, art and what is vandalism or criminal damage. If we come across a piece that we're not sure of, we have to uh, take pictures and then give it to our manager. We will decide whether we can remove it or keep it. As the head of service, I do have some discretion. And um, with regard to street art, um, there are pieces of very attractive street art that feature in books and calendars and magazines and websites. With some of the Banksy work that we've got, my personal opinion is that they are very artistic. I genuinely believe that it does add value. So when you say add value, what, what does that mean? Um, well, the stuff that we've got, there are groups of people that come to look at this kind of work because work of Banks's has been sold off for huge sums of money. Does it add value? Is it art? Graffiti writers see the approach by councils across the UK as double standards. Writers routinely attack Banksy pieces in the street, leaving the onlooker in no doubt as to which guerrilla artists they support in the graffiti war. It keeps Kenny's council very busy. I think with some of the Banksy pieces that we've had vandalized, we have occasionally gone around there and repaired them. So, for example, there was one where it was the museum attendant who had a mirror behind him and somebody actually wrote something offensive on the mirror. Well, we could have easily have just painted the mirror out with white paint or whatever colour paint it was, but then the piece wouldn't have made any sense. So what the guys carefully did was actually paint out the slogan or the rude word so that the piece was whole again. It's got to a stage where graffiti is still 100% outlawed and it's still illegal, unless you're Banksy. <laughs> when it's celebrated and preserved. Which is, you know, that's good for Banksy, but it's, it's kind of unfair on all the writers because whether it is graffiti, whether it's street art, you know, when you come up before the judge, does the judge ask for a definition? Is he a graffiti artist or is he a street artist? Is he street artist? Oh, that's okay, we'll let you off. Graffiti, no. When asked to comment on being given preferential treatment, Banksy said this. Robbo is preparing to attack another Banksy piece. Open the camera look in. But while Banksy is protected under Perspex, Robbo risks arrest and prosecution for any criminal damage. See how quick and easy it is to do a stencil. No skill whatsoever. Someone seems to be stopping and looking. Now, it's looking like oh, oh, off the bus of me. Look, look, one sec, let me finish doing this and I'll talk to you afterwards, all right? Because I've got to do this, yeah? Thanks. It's 
Quick as easy and simple as that. Real estate up. Yeah, look, my name's Robbo, yeah? Been having an argument with Banksy for years, since yeah. back in the 90s, I fell out with him. Yeah. I slapped him, and then all of a sudden, last year, he went over one of my pieces. It was the oldest piece in London. So since then, I've been going over all the I've got another fan. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Why has it got perspex on it? Because uh, someone from Team Robbo chucked paint over it and put a little Hitler moustache on the kiddie, and the council came down. They cleaned the graffiti off of it and stuck a sheet of perspex over it, and now it's protected for all eternity, so everyone can appreciate it, <laughs> which is quite funny. The irony of councils cleaning graffiti off of street art and then protecting it. It's pretty mad. But it's gone beyond the realm of local politics. Barack Obama used street art to become president. And David Cameron used street art to become his friend. Yeah, I've got a painting in the White House. But do you know where it's hanging? Toilet. In this room of unwanted gifts, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> This is called 21st Century City, painted by Ben Ein and given to Barack Obama by David Cameron in 2010 on his first state visit to Washington. I thought it was quite interesting because I'd obviously been arrested a few times and I've got a criminal record. Before his international success as a street artist, Ben was an infamous graffiti writer. That was the thing that got me arrested loads and loads and loads. I used to run around everywhere tagging that. How many times did you get arrested? Quite a few. Maybe, maybe as many as 20. I'd been arrested so many times and had so many fines that I was kind of giving the judge no other option but to send me to prison. Faced with a bleak future, then changed his approach. Gone was the hard to decipher code aimed at fellow graffiti writers. Here was a new style. Bold giant lettering painted onto walls and shop security shutters. As Ben's work gained kudos around the art scene in London's East End, so did his freedom to paint wherever and whenever he liked. I've painted some really, really big walls that have taken days to paint, and I've painted them in broad daylight without permission. Because it was street art and not graffiti, I got away with doing it. What sort of response do you get now, then, from the police if you're out working? <laughs> they come and talk to me. To think that a few years ago they'd have chased us down the street and nicked us. The former graffiti vandal has even been invited to Downing Street for a personal audience with the Prime Minister. Mr Cameron wanted to say thank you. We sat in the garden and had tea and biscuits and chatted and chatted about art and chatted about the state of the country and... <laughs> it was funny. What biscuits did they serve you? Kit Kats. <laughs> I'm massively privileged that I have the opportunity to live off of what I love doing. Yeah, it's amazing. A lot of graffiti writers are now beginning to understand that what they actually do is art. You know, they don't have to go to work and do a job that they hate. You know, they could get a studio, they could make their graffiti, they could have shows and they could sell it. <laughs> This is Mecca for the world's best street art and home to the galleries that bring it to a wider audience. An audience Robbo is now keen to engage. Oh, 
pop Tony down there. You got Tony? Hello? Robbo is being given the chance to make the transition from outlaw graffiti writer to professional artist. Just, um, we're just curating right now. Gallery owner, Pure Evil, has invited Robbo to stage his first solo show, and he's produced 20 new works of art. Tomorrow, they go on sale to the public. Oh, they do look nice, huh? You make an entrance, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big entrance. World-famous street artists show their work at this gallery. The fact that Robbo is now exhibiting here has not gone down well with some people. Frank's his fans. They're talking about coming to the gallery and flinging paint over all the artwork. Do you think they will come down and fling paint? Over? Not when I'm here, they won't. <laughs> I'm putting my head on the block because everyone's expecting graffiti and that, but I'm showing people that I'm more than just the graffiti artist, you know? Yeah, how bad would that be? Uh, making money at something you love doing. The future Robbo wants, where he makes a living from his art, depends whether or not this show is a success. That art, when I was doing it, I never thought I'd see that in a gallery. I just want to see it on every train. <laughs> now look, it's hanging up. It's all about the R, baby. The R. I just hope everyone comes and has a good time, and, you know, with an open mind. Let me into their world. That would be nice. It's the day of Robbo's first solo show. With so much riding on its outcome, he is waiting anxiously in a bar around the corner. I think if I was gonna buy anything, I'd buy that one, definitely. And maybe that one. Hello? It's rammed. It's completely rammed. There's loads of people standing outside, lots of people standing upstairs, wandering around, looking at the art. I've got one guy who's reserved yeah. two pieces. No! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, yeah. all my stuff down there is not slagging off Banksy. Our war on the street is between us. All right, it's entertainment for everyone else, but when I do my show, it ain't about slagging Banksy off, it's about showing people I'm an artist. And that's what I've got tonight. Following the success of his solo show, Robbo's ambition to work as a professional artist looks like becoming a reality. You know, I'm getting opportunities to do commissions all the time. I'm getting flown to Milan, Rome, Paris, like Berlin this time, New York. When you're an artist, you want people to see your stuff. Oh, I used to use the tube system in London for that to happen. Now I'm doing galleries and I'm commissioned. The broader scope of people now know who I am because of Banksy. Even though I don't think it was his intention. Because he went over my piece, it just gave me the kick up the arse I needed to get out there and do it. And I, I love it. Yeah, thanks, Mr. B. Robbo has been commissioned to promote a film premiering at the Berlin Film Festival. And he's painting a portrait of the film's star on this wall. But even here, it appears that Robbo cannot escape his arch nemesis. And it's right next door to Mr. B as well, so we assume who's the best. Let the art talk for itself. I'm going to do it freehand, whereas he can only stencil.
stunning. I'm excited for her to see it. Very pleased. I mean, like, come on. Who wouldn't, right? The film's director has brought actress Zoe Kravitz, whose face Robbo has carefully realized in spray paint, to the final unveiling. for a reason that his talent shows through his work and you know I think it's just the beginning for him and I'm, I'm honored to be part of it tonight Robbo is attending the film's premiere The only red carpet I've ever been on is during the 70s in my granddad's house. That's going to be a new experience. A boy from East London, he's, uh, he's on the red carpet in Berlin, hanging about with directors and stars. I'm in a really good place in the world. I'm really enjoying it. I'm just looking forward to the future. Banks has gone over my piece yet again. Um, and he's replaced it by what you see over there. He ain't trying to be better than me with graffiti. He'd come and do something like that, some stencils and some chalk, you know? But, you know, I could do that. Who knows? I might even do it. So is the war over? It's definitely not. How can it be? No, nah, he's had the last say, and I can't have that. With all the walls in London, He's come and gone over one of my pieces, which is not exactly easy to get to. So he's made it personal again. So what's next? I tell you what, why don't you come with me one night and I'll show you what's next. <laughs> but Robbo would never paint again. Just days after this filming took place, he was found unconscious in the street with life-threatening head injuries. And he's been in a coma ever since. There is no suggestion that Banksy or anyone associated with him was involved. A Team Robo exhibition goes ahead, giving friends and family the chance to celebrate the man whose career inspired a generation of graffiti writers and who, poignantly, was just about to get the respect he wanted as an artist. Robbo would have loved today. He'd love to paint art and get paid for it 24-7, you know. And uh, this is another step on the rung on, on his ladder of becoming a professional artist. Oh, I've known him years, he's a fighter. His time's not done, he's, you know, definitely not done. He's, there's so much more for him to do. It's been overwhelming, the amount of support um, that, that we've all got. Um, and, it, you know, it makes, me, it makes me proud. He's loved, he's really loved by a lot of people. Out on the streets, the graffiti community is showing support by paying tribute to its king. And the war between street artists, graffiti writers, and the authorities continues.
next Thursday on The Art of Hip Hop. It's about freedom. You learn what you want to learn, when you want to learn it. Making your own rules. It's anarchic. And busting a move. Meet the artists who make it and break it. The Art of Hip Hop, next Thursday at 8 on Ovation.